suffering at the hands of Rome, cause they believed in Christ alone. They died through Europe, especially Spain, for they saw all but Christ is vain. He suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin. Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand. The Roman popes rule the land. Those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy. We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie, with 50 million reasons why. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man, salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Good evening. Welcome to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. My name is Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next two hours. And we'll continue our reading and discussion of the most magnificent Protestant work in my library entitled Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness. It's a series of lectures put together by Henry Grattan Guinness back in the early night or the late 19th century, about 1870-ish somewhere in there, and those lectures were given in person to standing room only crowds, and they were so important that there was a widespread demand that Henry Grattan Guinness reduce those lectures to print, and therefore we have this book. Now this book, throughout its entirety, proves without controversy, conclusively, that the papacy is the antichrist of the scripture, that the papacy and all of its history from its earliest days to the present is the antichrist of scripture. The papacy is the antichrist. It always was the antichrist, and it always will be the antichrist And this book captures the writings and quotes from the most popular Bible-believing Christians throughout all of the Christian era. And we discover from this book that every single one of them were historicists in their belief that the papacy was the Antichrist. And the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan, the whore that rides the bloody beast or the scarlet-colored beast in Revelation chapter 17. Every one of them, to the man, every one of them, without exception, believed what Henry Grattan Guinness believed. From the earliest days, Bible-believing Christians prayed for the longevity of the Roman, the pagan Roman Caesars, the pagan Roman Empire, because they knew that what replaced it would be the Antichrist of Scripture. That is the basics of Christianity. It always was the basics of Christianity. It always will be the basics of Christianity that
our persecutor, the Antichrist of Scripture. Now, we've talked about those who believe these things in apostolic times and post-apostolic times. We've talked about the, the, those who are regarded as the church fathers. They believe that the papacy or whatever it was that was going to replace the old Roman Empire would be the Antichrist of Scripture. They all agreed. There were some differences to detail, but we have to remember that they had not yet seen these prophecies fulfilled. They were simply going by the prophecies and predicting what the Antichrist would be. And they named it. Simply by reading the prophecies, they knew what the Antichrist would be like. And sure enough, when the papacy came into power after the old Roman Empire collapsed, they saw those prophecies fulfilled with their own eyes. And they knew that their prognostication, their interpretation of the prophecies were correct. And they perfectly predicted the papacy. There were no doubters in any of their minds who the Antichrist is or who it would be. Then we come past the apostolic times into the early Christians, the Waldenses, the Albigensians, those who we talked about last time on the broadcast. How did they interpret the scriptures? Why, exactly the way the early church fathers did, that it was the papacy. Only they had the advantage of looking back on the history of the papacy and absolutely confirming that it was the papacy, could only be the papacy, and that there wasn't even another candidate on the earth that could be the Antichrist but the papacy. They confirmed what I have suggested in the past. Christ, in, uh, Christ made the prophecies in the Bible predicting the arrival of our Messiah so precise, even to quote the words that Jesus would say as he hung on the cross for our sins, Jesus made it so perfectly easy in the scriptures to, to identify Jesus as the Messiah, and he made it equally as easy for us to identify the Antichrist in the scriptures. Why would God go to the trouble of, of portraying Christ's life in the, in the prophecies long before his, his, his coming and do it in a way as to make it virtually impossible to miss the Messiah? Everyone knows God wants us to know who our Messiah is. He predicted the very words he would say. On the, he predicted his birth. Vir- cross. There can be no doubt about who our Messiah is. So why is the Christian world so in a quandary about who the Antichrist is, especially when no Christian before our time or the about three or four generations prior to our time, no Christian was in a quandary about who the Antichrist was. They were as convinced about who the Antichrist was as they were convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. God does not deal treacherously with his people. There's no excuse for the Jews to reject Jesus. They had to deny all of prophecy to deny that Christ was the Messiah, that Jesus was the Messiah. Why would God deal treacherously with us about who, the, who, who, who our Christ would be? Is God a deceiver? Is God a trickster? Does he play games with his people? Anyone who's familiar with the scriptures and familiar with Jesus' life in the New Testament, as is recorded, can come to only one conclusion. He was the son of the living God the redeemer of mankind. And anyone who denies that would simply deny their own image in a mirror. 
No room for error. No room for speculation. No room for guesswork. As a matter of fact, anyone who denies that Jesus was the Christ of prophecy in Scripture would deny his own identity. It's ludicrous to suggest that Jesus was not the Messiah. So if identifying Christ was such a great preoccupation of God in the Scriptures, why would he deal treacherously with Christians after Christ about who the Antichrist would be? And clearly by this book, you can see that God did not deal treacherously with his people. He identified the papacy so completely that there is no room for error, no room for speculation, no room for quandary, no room for controversy. And there was no controversy. From the earliest church fathers in apostolic times throughout the Christian era, it's only in our generation. And why? Because we've been taught futurism. We've been taught to abandon historicism. We've been taught to believe that Antichrist has not come in this world and won't come, won't even be a consideration for us to worry about or even a cut to raise controversy about until the last seven years of time. How ludicrous. It is a it is a bald faced lie so ridiculous that it's a miracle that anybody believes it. Yet the whole Christian world today believes that Antichrist has not come and won't come until just before Jesus' return. It's incomprehensible, the blindness that has overtaken Christianity today. It could hardly be called Christianity. It's a form of godliness, but it denies the power thereof. Prophecy fulfilled. Now, Henry Grattan Guinness has told us about the early church fathers, then the Waldenses, who held the gospel, even from the earliest times, were persecuted in Rome, fled to the Alps, continued to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and condemn and rebuke the papacy as Antichrist. So did the Albigensians, and now we're even going to talk about the Hussites of Bohemia. They, too, condemned the papacy as the Antichrist of the Scriptures. Now, remember, Henry Grattan Guinness has given these in a form of oral lectures in front of a standing-room-only crowd. And he's standing up before this crowd, and he says, and by the way, if you're following along in the text, we're on page 217, about three or four lines down from the top. Henry Grattan Guinness says, here is a history of the Reformation and the anti-Reformation of Bohemia. Stop right there. Henry Grattan Guinness acknowledges the Protestant Reformation, and he acknowledges something that is never acknowledged today in Christianity, the anti-Reformation. We call it the counter-Reformation. Rome, after the Protestant Reformation, called together the Jesuits, or rather the Jesuits, called together the Council of Trent to strategize about how to destroy the Protestant Reformation. And guess what they chose to do? They chose to teach in our own seminaries futurism. And consequently, because of the Jesuits and the Counter-Reformation launched at the Council of Trent, we now all believe futurism. And as a matter of course, if you're futurist 
and believe the Antichrist doesn't come until the last seven years before Jesus returns, then you have exonerated the historic understanding of the papacy as the Antichrist. And that's exactly the state of affairs in Christianity today. And it is not illegitimate to say, for as much as futurism is believed in the body of Christ today, there is no, there is no Protestantism in this country. Protestantism is dead. Why? Because we departed from historicism and the belief that every Christian had before our time that the papacy was the Antichrist, the Roman Catholic Church was the whore of Revelation chapter 17, the persecutor of the saints. We have denied all of Christian history. We have forgotten all of Christian history. And we have believed a lie, a most ingenious lie, We have committed spiritual suicide in believing that lie. And now Rome, seeing that we are all futurists in our belief, is now free to completely take over our governments and to use those governments to persecute the saints of Almighty God, just like Rome did before the Protestant Reformation. If any of you are familiar with my program on First Amendment Radio. It's called Inquisition Update. Because Rome is now in complete control. She has no opposition from God's house. And what does Rome do when the coast is clear? Nobody's looking. Nobody suspects. She begins freely and copiously to kill God's people, to persecute and kill God's people, just like she did the early Christians during the pagan Roman Empire, just like she did the Waldenses for 600 years, persecuted and pursued and annihilated the Waldenses, the same as she did with the Albigensians, the same as she did with the Hussites, the same as she did with the Protestant reformers. She's going to do again right here in Protestant USA. Why? Because there's no Protestantism anymore. There's no watchman on the wall to warn God's people that the Antichrist is going to return to her bloodthirsty ways. They've wiped out the history of the Protestant martyrs the martyrs of Jesus throughout the entire Christian era, no mention is made of the millions and hundreds of millions who have died in the most gruesome forms, forms that we are going to discuss tonight on this program. All of that history has been wiped out of our libraries, out of our churches, out of our schools, out of the mainstream media, even out of the alternative media. No one has a clue what Rome is about to do in this country. And it's all because we believed a lie, a futurist lie. Now the fox watches, watches the hen house and there's no, no reason, no reason to even wear the sheep's clothing anymore. Nobody fears her. Nobody even acknowledges her presence or her power, or her control of the governments of the world. All because of the Jesuits, the Council of Trent, and the Counter-Reformation, the Anti-Reformation. Futurism. Rome is now free to do whatever she wants, and the whole world wonders after the beast, just as the prophecies predict. Now do you comprehend what I've said before, that our generation of Christians are the most apostate Christians since Jesus walked the streets of Jerusalem. And we have so much of which to repent. 
Henry Grant and Guinness is standing before his audience holding up a book. He says, here is a history of the Reformation and the anti-Reformation of Bohemia. The Bohemian Brethren avowed the doctrines of John Huss, including his views on the anti-papal prophecies. The anti-papal prophecies. John Huss believed that the prophecies of Daniel, of Paul, and of John were about none else than the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. The papacy. John Huss believed, just as did the early church fathers, the Albigensians, the Waldensians, and every true Bible-believing Christian throughout the Christian era. John Huss had followers, true Bible-believing Christians who read the Bible for themselves, read those very prophecies, and agreed, all agreed unanimously, that the papacy and only the papacy fulfilled those prophecies. It was a dead ringer. God described the Antichrist in the prophecies, and they saw with their own eyes its perfect fulfillment in the, in the papacy. He says, Rome exterminated the reformed Bohemians. The story is a dreadful one, he says, and now he gives us a note. He says, in the year 1421, the miseries of the Bohemians greatly increased. Besides the execution by drowning, by fire, and by sword, several thousands of the followers of John Huss, especially the Taborites. Have you ever heard of the Taborites? I've never heard of the Taborites. But they were followers of John Huss, too. They, too, believed that the papacy was the Antichrist. He said the Taborites, especially the Taborites, of all ranks of both sexes, were thrown down the old mines and pits of Guttenberg. Who threw them down the pits? Who, who, who persecuted the Hussites and the Taborites? The papacy, he goes on to say, in one pit were thrown 1,700. In another pit were thrown 1,308. And in a third, 1,321 persons. And every year on the 18th of April, a solemn meeting was held in a chapel built there in memory of those martyrs until the year 1613, when the mint master Wershowitz endeavored to prevent their celebration. Yet it continued until the great persecution of 1621. So the Christians, the Bible-believing Christians, the true Bible-believing Christians, those who obeyed and worshipped Jesus Christ, and rebuked the papacy as the Antichrist, were persecuted and killed by drowning, by fire, by sword, and even by being thrown down in old mine shafts and pits to starve to death, to the tune of thousands and thousands of God's people. And every year, it was marked by a celebration on the 18th of April of every year to memorialize God's markers. But Rome tried to prevent that celebration. Why? Because she doesn't want the world to know about her history. Rome doesn't want the world to see with their own eyes that the Vatican fulfills every one of the prophecies regarding Antichrist. Rome doesn't want the world to remember all her martyrs and all of her persecutions. And the governments of the world cooperate with it. Your public school systems cooperate with it. Your churches cooperate with it. You're not allowed to talk about the persecution of the Roman Catholic Church against the early church fathers, against the apostolic time, 
against the Waldensians, against the Albigensians, against the Hussites, against the Jaborites, against every drop of blood that Rome has shed for the last 2,000 years. You're not allowed to talk about it because, well, it's just bigotry or anti-Roman Catholic hatred. You know, we're wise to remind ourselves of the persecutions and murders of the, of the Nazis. We're always constantly reminded of Adolf Hitler and the six million Jews that he murdered, crucified, cremated, alive. We're never allowed to forget that. We don't want to forget that. But do you know, as soon as you identify the people that Adolf Hitler was a Roman Catholic all his life, that his parents were Roman Catholic, that in 1933 Adolf Hitler signed a concordat with the Roman Catholic Church, the, 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 uh, the prelate named Eugenio Pacelli, who would eventually become Pope, Pope uh Pius XII, signed a concordat with the Antichrist of the Bible to make sure that the Roman Catholic Church would not be persecuted during the Second World War. And Adolf Hitler signed it. And who did he persecute? Jews. Six million of them. And you know, nobody ever talks about the millions and millions of Protestants that he killed. We're not allowed to talk about it. Uh, We're talking about the persecution of the saints in Bohemia. They were called the Hussites and obviously the Taborites, and we're quoting words written by John Huss talking about the persecution of the saints. He says, In one pit were thrown 1,700, in another 1,308, and in a third... 1,321 persons, and every year on the 18th of April, a solemn meeting was held in a chapel built there in memory of those martyrs until the year 1613, when the Mintmaster Wurchesowitz endeavored to prevent it, that is, the celebration. Yet, it continued until the great persecution of 1621. A monument, it is said, still marks the place where these mines were, where all these people were killed. And then he cites all of the literary works, the Protestant literary works, where these facts are revealed and gives the page numbers. Now he continues. He says, but from their ashes rose new witnesses, From the persecuted Bohemians sprang the Moravians, who this day are missionaries throughout the world. Turn lastly for a moment to England. Before the Protestant Reformation, 500 years ago, God raised up in this country John Wycliffe. Men called him the morning star of the Reformation. He translated the scriptures into the English tongue and waged war against the errors and abominations of the Church of Rome. How did Wycliffe interpret these prophecies? Why, just as the Waldenses did. Here's one of his books filled with references to the Pope as Antichrist. He wrote a special treatise entitled Speculum de Antichristo, which means the mirror of Antichrist. From John Wycliffe sprang the English Lollards. Ever hear of the Lollards? Have you ever heard of any of these people? Any of these groups? You have to ask yourself, why not? Who's responsible for the loss of our Protestant heritage? He says the Lollards numbered hundreds of thousands. What was their testimony? 
Let me give it to you in the words of one of them, Lord Cobham, that famous man of God who lived just a century before Martin Luther. When brought before King Henry V and admonished to submit himself to the Pope as an obedient child, this was his answer. Quote, as touching the Pope and his spirituality, I owe them neither suit nor service. For as much as I know him by the scriptures to be the great Antichrist, the son of perdition, the open adversary of God, and an abomination standing in the holy place, unquote. Would there be any Christian so-called in this country from border to border or from shore to shore that would stand up publicly in any public place and denounce the papacy as the Antichrist of Scripture, the son of perdition, and the open adversary of God? Again, you have to ask yourself, why not? What has happened to Protestantism? What has happened to historicism? What has happened to the belief and doctrine of every Bible-believing Christian from the time of Jesus right up until four generations ago? Who has deceived God's people? Each and every one of the listeners of this program has to ask himself that question and not only ask it, but to answer it. And I'm going to give you the answer. The papacy. With the cooperation of our government, of our press, of our churches, and our pastors, and our public school system. You're not allowed to know the truth. Why? Because you must believe in futurism. If you know anything about historicism, then you denounce futurism as a lie, and that means the papacy goes back to being the Antichrist of Scripture. And that means Protestants will begin to spring to life in this country and start to examine the civil laws of this land, federal, state, and local, and discover what I have discovered, that they are simply mirrors of Roman Catholic canon law and that we have been enslaved by the papacy and every law of this land is designed to make us subjects of the papacy. And the Bible says, the whole world wonders after the beast. That's exactly what we are. Wanderers after the beast. We obey man's law, which is papal law, and we say that those who call ourselves Christians today say, God's law is dead. I ought to ask you a question. When Jesus walked the streets of Jerusalem, who did he openly condemn? Do you remember? Who Jesus openly condemned and reviled with his own mouth? The lawyers and the doctors. The religious leaders of his day. Why did he revile the, the, the doctors and the lawyers because they had replaced God's law with man's law. And aren't we doing the same thing today? We Christians, don't we hold all kinds of reverence and obedience to man's law? And yet not a single one of us, hardly, in this whole country, can recite God's law, the Ten Commandments. And because we don't know the Ten Commandments, we can't observe and identify how man's law, every single one of them, are a contravention 
of God's holy law. And that's exactly why Jesus condemned the lawyers and the doctors of his day. Because they simply did the same thing that we've done today. Washington is full of doctors and lawyers. Those who've made their entire living in the business of man's law, completely forsaking and replacing God's law with man's law. And every one of us obeys man's law and can't even identify God's law anymore. The whole nation of Israel, practically, denied that Jesus was the Messiah. They still do today. And don't we do the same? Those of us who call ourselves Christians and think that man's law is the law of this land, never even giving a thought about God's law. God's law says, thou shalt not kill. But the whole history of the Roman Catholic Church is bathed in the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. The whole history of the United States is bathed in the blood shed by wars, wars, and rumors of wars. No thought is given to God's law. And who does the United States government fight for? Certainly not for God. It sheds blood in the name of the papacy. And they don't tell you that either. Henry Grattan Guinness continues, he says, Remaining firm in his rejection of Romish error and refusal to bow down to the papacy, Lord Cobham was condemned to death as a heretic. John Fox, the martyrologist, tells us that on the day appointed for his death in the year 1417, Lord Cobham was brought out of the Tower of London, quote, with his arms bound behind him, having a very cheerful countenance. Then he was laid upon a hurdle and so drawn forth into St. Gilly's Field where they had set up a new pair of gallows. As he was coming to the place of execution, now remember, they're going to kill him just simply for calling the papacy what he is, the Antichrist. As he was coming to the place of execution and was taken from the hurdle, he fell down devoutly upon his knees, desiring Almighty God to forgive his enemies. Then stood he up and beheld the multitude, exhorting him in most godly manner to follow the laws of God written in the scriptures and in any wise to beware of such teachers as they see contrary to Christ in their conversation and living with many other special counsels. He was preaching. He went to the gallows knowing that he was going to be burned alive. And yet he was denouncing Antichrist, denouncing Roman Catholic canon law, denouncing civil law, and admonishing the people to obey God's law and many other such like counsels. Then he was hanged up there by the middle. They wrapped a chain around his waist and hung him from the chain wrapped around his waist. He said... <clears throat> Then he was hanged up there by the middle in the chains of iron and so consumed alive in the fire, praising the name of God as long as his life lasted, unquote. In other words, says Henry Grattan Guinness, he was roasted to death. They were burned. Burned, these blessed men of God. John Huss was burned. Jerome was burned, Lord Cobham was burned, Jerome was burned, Lord Cobham was burned. Even Wycliffe's bones were dug up 41 years after his death and burned. John Wycliffe, 
the morning star of the Reformation, the one who translated God's holy word into the English language. The papacy had his bones dug up 41 years after his death, and they burned his bones. Savonarola, who was a Roman Catholic monk, who preached with trumpet tongue that Rome was Babylon, was burned. All these were burned before the Protestant Reformation and thousands more. They were burned, but their words were never burned. Their testimony was not burned. It lives on. It lives on today in Tom Fress. Fire could not torch it. Chains could not bind it. Gags could not silence it. Goals could not stifle it. Swords could not slay it. Nothing could destroy the truth. Truth is immortal. Truth is unconquerable. Imprison it, and it comes forth free. Bury it, and it erases again. Crush it to the earth, and it springs up victorious, purer for the conflict, nobler for the victory. What truth is Henry Gratton Guinness talking about here? That Jesus is the Christ, that the papacy is the Antichrist. That is the truth for which all of God's people were burned. The truth to which these confessors witnessed sprang up again a century later and rolled over Europe the tremendous tide of the Protestant Reformation. And whence came this testimony which no power could repress? Whence came this testimony, trumpet-tongued, that Rome, in all its myriad-handed might, was impotent to silence or arrest? Whence came it from but that sacred volume, the Bible, writ in gloomy prisons, in lands of captivity, in scenes of exile, for the guidance, the preservation, the support of God's suffering saints and faithful witnesses in every age. In every age. Not just the last seven years of time before Christ's return, but in every age, from the time of Christ until he returns. That's what the Bible prophesies. The entire history of the faithful saints of Jesus Christ from the earliest days until Christ returns. But Rome would have you believe something else, that all these prophecies won't be fulfilled until the last seven years before Christ's return. How convenient for the papacy, the Antichrist of the Scripture, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist of Scripture, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the one who persecutes the saints, who has done it for nearly 1,800 years, and there isn't but a handful of Christians in this whole United States that understands this. It's incomprehensible, the blindness and ignorance of God's people today. Incomprehensible. There are not words to describe the blindness and the apostasy of God's house today, especially in this land once called Protestant. There's not one single Protestant on the Supreme Court of the United States of America. For the first time in the history of this nation, there's not one single Protestant on that court. And who's complaining? And how many of them can tell you, how many Americans can tell you that six of the nine are Roman Catholics? And five of those are Knights of Malta. You see how effective the anti-Reformation has been? 
how totally destructive of Protestantism were the Jesuits and the Council of, of Trent and Futurism, their master plan to destroy Reformation. So much so success that nobody even protests that there's not one single Protestant on the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Not only that, but that the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, the papacy has a controlling majority, a super majority on that court. And they're the ones who interpret the Constitution. That's the job of the Supreme Court, to interpret the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Guess what Rome's planning to do with all those Catholics? Guess what Rome has already done with those Roman Catholics on the Supreme Court? They've absolutely stripped you of every Protestant right that was granted you in the Bill of Rights. Yes, that's right. Rome didn't want that Bill of Rights attached to our Constitution. Rome did everything she could not to have a Bill of Rights in the Constitution. But at the time of the signing of the Constitution, there was still a little Protestantism left in this country, and they insisted that if we're going to ratify that Constitution, you've got to guarantee us the right of religious liberty, freedom of speech, so that we can condemn the papacy and the king of this country if they ever get in bed together and begin to persecute God's people. We want the right to preach and teach from the rooftops that we have inalienable given, God-given rights to condemn the papacy and to preach Jesus Christ. We have the right, the God-given right, to be Protestant. But now we have Catholics on the Supreme Court whose job it is to interpret the Constitution and the Bill of Rights or to simply set it aside completely. And that's exactly what they're doing. Now, there is your Inquisition update. Anybody with a brain, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't need to be, and especially not, a seminarian to know what's coming next. Every age was talked about in the scriptures. There is no futurism in the Bible. It's all historicism. All of it. We're the only ones who are deluded. We are the only ones who have been deceived in the entire Christian history. Because we believe the lie. We believe it and we teach it. From every pulpit, from every news broadcast, from every college course, from every high school course, from every grade school course, from every direction... We are taught futurism. Well, Tom, how can that be? Because nobody, and I mean nobody, in all the institutions that I've just mentioned, ever says that the papacy is the Antichrist of Scripture. Not the government, not the Supreme Court especially, not Congress not the the public school system, not the colleges and universities, not the churches, not the seminaries. You're not allowed in this country to condemn the papacy as Antichrist. Why? Because that's hate speech. You could be marked a domestic terrorist if you denounce the papacy as the Antichrist. You might be a domestic terrorist, if you identify yourself as a Protestant. Rome's free to do whatever she wants to now. And you're either going to go along with her Council of Trent 
and her Vatican Council II and ecumenism and reunion with the Roman Catholic Church and acknowledgement of the papacy as the replacement of Jesus Christ on the earth and that every man, woman, and child on this earth as a matter of salvation must become a subject of the Pope or die a martyr's death. That is where we're going. That's where we are. Every Christian knew the truth before our generation. Every Christian taught the truth prior to our generation. We're the only ones who are deceived. He says, Daniel the captive, Paul the prisoner, John the exile, such were its inspired authors, the Bible. Men whose piercing visions look down the long vista of the, church conflict, the church's conflicts, marked her martyrdoms and saw her triumphs from afar. Where's the futurism in that? There isn't any. It's all historicism. The prophet Daniel, the prophet and apostle Paul, the prophet and apostle John, saw the entire history of the, of the church of Jesus Christ and all of her conflicts and all of her martyrdoms and all of her trials and tribulations, all of her persecutions. And the last 1,800 years have, have, have been witness of the accuracy of their predictions, and all of it falls in the lap of the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church and we are oblivious to it. There is no excuse. None. God revealed our history long before. God's people have seen the fulfillment of that history. How could we be deceived? O oh, word of divinely given prophecy, O oh, wondrous volume, whose seven seals the Lamb has loosed and opened to meet the moral and spiritual needs of the suffering church he loves so well. How have thy solemn utterances, thy, my, thy my mysterious symbols, been scanned and studied by earnest, saintly eyes? How hast thou been pondered in prisons, Remembered on racks, repeated in the flames. Thy texts are windows through which the light shines from the third heaven down to the darkest depths of earth's conflicts, mysteries, and woes. O oh, sacred and sanctifying truth, how have thy words been watered with the tears of suffering saints, steeped in their griefs and sorrows, and died in the copious streaming of their blood? Precious are the lives which they have sealed. Precious the truth those lives have sealed. Thy words have been wings by which the persecuted church has soared from the wilderness and the battlefield into the pure, serene, and everlasting love and peace. Like a bright angel, thou art heaven descended and leadest to the skies. By thee has God guided to their glorious consummation the noble army of saints, confessors, martyrs, shining round his throne like the everlasting stars. They are gone into that world of glory, forever gone, but the light which led them there remains behind. We cannot touch them. They have vanished from the sight of men like the prophet whose chariot to the heavens was the winged flame. We cannot hear the music of their harpings or the thunder of their song, but we still grasp the book they loved, which made them all they were and all they are. Ye Waldenses, from the lonely, blood-stained Alps, ye nameless victims of the dreadful Inquisition, ye noble Protestants before the Protestant Reformation, Wycliffe, Huss, Jerome, Cobham, Savonarola, we possess the holy pages which ye pondered, the words of truth and life 
ye sealed with martyr's blood. Be those words to us what they were to you. Let them be our inspiration and our testimony and the testimony of our children after us till the hour when truth, emancipated from all trammels, shall shine through the world in its unclouded splendor and error and superstition and Roman Catholicism and popery and falsehood from its presence shall forever flee away. And I'm here to tell you that that day won't happen until Christ himself returns and destroys her. Why? Because we're clueless about the ultimate prophesied end of the Roman Catholic Church because we don't understand the scriptures. That sacred volume that every Christian before us revered and read, and pondered, and sought to understand, we have not a clue about that book or its prophecies. That's why we're deceived. That's why we're enslaved. And that's why Jesus is going to have to come to destroy her, because we don't have a clue. We are no less enslaved and deceived and controlled and owned than the Jews under Pharaoh. The Protestant Reformation was our Red Sea crossing. And we've simply gone back to Pharaoh. Nobody protests anymore. We call ourselves Christians. We say we believe in, worship, and obey Christ. Then how is it that we are slaves to the papal Pharaoh? We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away and go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.